Steve Earl Jones is the only person who probably enjoys the sound of his own voice. <laughs> and he does it well. He does it well. So, uh, so good afternoon, everyone. So, this is our Modern Workplace uh, Security and Compliance uh, webinar, and today we're going to talk about uh, Azure Sentinel. We've got Andrea Fisher, a Modern Workplace uh, Security Specialist in state and local government at Microsoft, who's going to uh, be our presenter. So, uh, with that being said, I'll hand it over to Andrea. Thank you, Tony. So, hey, everyone, as Tony said, my name is Andrea Fisher. I sit in sunny Tampa, Florida, and I have been at Microsoft about 10 years now covering mostly modern workplace and security. So thank you all for inviting to talk. Let me talk to you today. So we're going to start out and we're going to do just a few slides just to sort of set the stage and then we will jump right into the tool so you guys can get a look at what you would be um, uh, getting to see on a daily basis if it's something that truly interests you and uh, we'll dig in and sort of pretend that we are a, a SOC analyst for the day. So let me get my screen shared here. And we'll, we have to, you know, we have to do a few marketing slides. So we'll go ahead and do those and get them out of the way. So <clears throat> actually, before I came to Microsoft, I worked at Raymond James, which the only reason you may have heard of it is that where they played the Super Bowl. So uh, Raymond James Stadium, but I worked uh, for Raymond James. And one of the last things I did before I left was actually a SIM. I'm old, so we call it a SIM. I know a lot of people call it a SIEM these days, but uh, a SIM project. And uh, honestly, it was a nightmare. It ended up taking twice as many servers and twice as much storage as we expected it to take. And to me, that's one of the things that I love the most about Sentinel is uh, you don't have to commit to any upfront costs or any actual infrastructure, right? Because everything is in the cloud and it can scale to be what you need it to be, right? Uh, so our aim is to really provide you with a cost-effective SIM solution. And uh, so that's certainly one of the best parts to me is those, you know, no server costs. You're really only paying for data ingestion and data storage. So as much data as you bring in and however long you want to keep it, that's where the cost lies, right? But one of the benefits also of the Microsoft SIM tool is that you get to bring in a significant portion of your Microsoft 365 data for free. And we'll talk a little bit more about that in detail. Uh, like we talked about flexible model, you can uh, scale up or down as you need to. So these, uh, we'll call these the um, things that the money people have to worry about. But for the security folk, this to me is a lot of the important stuff. You know, we use Sentinel ourselves and have the same problem that everyone else does, which is too many alerts and not enough people. So our goal is really to help you cut those false positives and to reduce the alert fatigue. We really want to help you automate up to 90% of the alerts so your team can focus on just really the complex things. We can take care of the easy stuff, right? Uh, and then let's take a quick look at uh, sort of an overview here. We talked about what can we ingest into Sentinel, right? So honestly, if it's a log, we can pretty much bring it in, but we'll talk about that some more. So we talked about, right, the ability to bring in all of the Microsoft Cloud services. Uh, we've got over 90 third-party solutions. So Cisco, Palo Alto, Fortinet, Checkpoint, right? All of those can be brought in. If you have logs on-prem, right? If you have servers on-prem, we can bring that stuff in. We can bring in your mobile devices, IoT. Uh, all of those things can be brought into Sentinel. Once that happens, we can tap into Microsoft's threat intelligence system, which I'm sure you've heard us mention before that we call the intelligent security graph. And it processes about 7 trillion signals a day that come from the endpoints that come from Hotmail, that come from um, network and malware reports, right? And we can bring all of that data together to look at trends across the globe. So we can integrate with things like geolocation and IP reputation to really help you enrich your investigations. And once we do that, we apply some built-in machine learning as well as some user entity behavior analytics. Uh, and we can apply all of that to the data. And then once we do that, we can, uh, we'll walk through some analyzing of the data itself. And 
then if you're so inclined, we want to help you automate those responses, right? So if it's 2 a.m. and we see a password spray attack or a brute force attack against a specific account, maybe we immediately disable that account, right? Maybe that's what we do when we automate the responses. But we have lots of choices for that as well. And then we'll talk this. This is just sort of another way to look at it. So you can see we talked about you can bring in your own threat intelligence. So if you subscribe to Anomaly or Sticks, we can bring that in. We talked about those uh, firewalls, right? We can bring all this stuff in, syslog over TLS, HTTP proxy, depending on how we are bringing in that data. But we have uh, lots of options, and we'll talk about that in just a second. So now we can get rid of the boring slides. Those are no fun. And we will dig into this is the Azure Sentinel console. So this is where you'd most likely start uh, the day and taking a look at what's going on. But I really like to start here because it gives just sort of a nice, just a general view of what do we do with the SIM, right? So what do we got to do? We got to get data. We're going to alert on the data. And then we are, if we're so inclined, right, we can automate our response to these alerts. So when we connect to get that data, and you can do that either here or through the data connectors, you'll see that we have a list of close to 100 data connectors. Oh, look, we've got 113 in this environment now. You can see several of them say preview, which means that these are in private preview. So if you sign up for the private preview, you can kick the tires on some of these new ones. But you can see we have everything we've got. Ah, come on. Question? No? Okay. I thought I heard somebody say something. So, uh, like we said, we've got Akamai or Amazon Web Services, or um, like we said, we got Blackberry, Cisco, Checkpoint, Palo Alto. They're all in here. We have another 130 connectors coming before the end of the year. But even if we don't have a specific connector, we can still use syslog, which is in here somewhere. Where are you, syslog? Uh, we can still use syslog or Ceph connectors if we don't actually have a specific connector for your data. But let's take a quick peek. There's four kinds of connectors. One is just called the direct connection, and this is for most of the data that comes into that from Microsoft. So if we take a quick look at the description, if I turn on this connector, what am I going to get? I'm going to learn about app usage, conditional access policies, sign-in logs, self-service password reset, right? So the description will always tell you, what am I going to get if I turn this on, right? We can open the connector page. And once we do this, we give you a nice, handy little uh, graphical way to know if you're good to go. I have three check marks here, which means I've got perms and sometimes it'll be licensed. But for this specific one, I got all the perms I need. I got three check marks. I'm good to go. Once I have those check marks, I literally will come down here and check these check boxes. Say apply changes. And within about five minutes, that Azure Active Directory information is going to start flowing into Sentinel. Uh, we also have what we call have an agented selection. So Windows security events or DNS or your domain controllers. When we do that, we're going to install what we call the Microsoft monitoring agent. You may be familiar with that if you use OMS, uh, but we install the MMA agent on the machines. You can do that with SCCM, PowerShell, GPO, however you want to do it. But once we install that MMA agent, it will start sending that data up here as well. Then what we have we call syslog with agent. So that would be something like Cisco ASA or something. And let's look at one of these. So if we click on the Cisco, and again, it'll tell us what you're going to get, dashboards, alerts, right, all that. And again, here it's going to give us that same view. We're going to get those uh, check marks, hopefully. So I got my check marks, meaning I'm good to go. And then there's an explanation of what do you have to do, right? So you need a syslog server. If you already have one, great. If not, we can help you build one in Azure. And once you got that syslog server turned on, 
you got to make sure you got Python. You got to make sure you got sudo. And once you do, you're going to run this command, right? And once you do that, you may have to do some stuff on the Cisco or the Palo Alto side uh, just to tell it, you know, make sure you're sending it here. And then once that happens, again, data is coming in. So, uh, but each of these will give you step by step instructions on how to connect. And uh, hopefully that will make your life a little easier because getting the data into a sim is usually one of the most uh, painful issues, like you said, after the number of servers. Uh, so once we get the data in, what are we going to do? We want to be notified when something suspicious happens. So to do this, we'll pop here into analytics. I wish this were just called alerts, but of course at Microsoft, we could never name anything easy. Uh, so you can see here, I have 86 rules turned on and I could create new ones if I wanted to, but we also have a series of built-in templates and there are over 200 built-in templates. And you can see the ones I've turned on, say in use, right? So these are out of the box built-in templates that are either designed by our team of security experts or have been designed in conjunction with Palo Alto or Cisco or whomever, right? And they help us analyze the data based on known threats and common attack vectors or suspicious escalation changes. Uh, or like we said, you can create your own template, but um, normally what I do when I come in here, let's say we just turned on Azure Active Directory. So I would come in here and I would pick Azure AD as a data source. And I would look at all the possible rules, right? So here are all the rules, 38 rules for Azure AD. And I would decide which ones I wanna turn on. You can turn them all on. You can be uh, frugal. I have one coworker that says he uses the Marie Kondo method. He only turns on the ones that bring him joy. Uh, but I'm a big fan of turning on more rather than less. But you can see there are things like brute force attack against the Azure portal. If you guys are using MFA, this will tell you if someone has attempted to disable MFA, a password spray attack, uh, maybe an anomalous sign in location or someone attempting to sign into disabled accounts. Right. So with any of these, we can see over here on the uh, right hand side, we get again a description. What is it? So this is going to identify failed attempts to sign into disabled accounts across multiple Azure applications. It's using the sign in logs and you can see I've got this little green handshake, which means I'm already pulling in the sign in logs. So I've got the data I need. If this were gray, it would mean we had not turned the connector on, right? We've got the initial access here, which is the MITRE tactic. We've got the actual query rule language that is being run. If we were interested, we could dig into there. It's gonna run every day. Uh, and it's going to look over the last days of traffic, right? So this is just giving an information about the rule. So we could go ahead and we'll just pick one of these so you guys can see what it looks like. We can create the rule. When we go through that creation process, again, I can rename it if I want to. This is the actual logic that the rule is running. So, and you know, in the beginning, I leave all the rules just the way they are, but maybe a month or two in, maybe we'll take a peek and see, um, do we want to change this to 20 minutes? Do we want to add some different sign and log types, right? Just, you know, there may be some changes that we make in the beginning. Um, and if we want to start grouping these alerts together, so maybe instead of getting one, if they happen within five hours each other, we're gonna put them together in a single group. You know, one of the powerful things that we talked about with Sentinel is its ability to do automation. So I could use playbooks. So like we said here, if there's a successful logon from IP and a failure from a different IP, maybe I'm gonna immediately block that IP, right? Or maybe I'm just gonna send an email to my team, right? It's really up to us on how we want to react. And then we literally just hit the button that says create. And we have another rule enabled. So now you see we've got 87 rules enabled. 
So that's all the boring part, right? This is the stuff you got to do to get it working. Uh, and maybe I'll talk about real quickly here while we're here. You can see there's a couple different kinds of alerts. So we have what we call the Microsoft Security Rule Type. And um, these automatically create Sentinel incidents from the alerts from other tools. So you can see like this specific one is creating incidents based on um, Defender Advanced Threat Protection or what we now call Defender for Identity, right? Uh, and, or from Office 365 Advanced Threat Protection or from Cloud App Security, right? So it's bringing in the data from those other tools and alerting me on it. Then we have what we call the Fusion Alerts. And the Fusion Alerts, um, they are an advanced multi-stage attack detection and they use machine learning algorithms that correlate low fidelity alerts across multiple products and that can convert them into high fidelity actionable incidents. So if maybe we get a bunch of yellow alerts, but those same yellow alerts are happening across 20 servers, you know, maybe that's going to throw one of those fusion alerts for us. Uh, we also have another set called the machine learning behavioral analytics. And those, you can't see the internal logic of how they work. Unlike, you know, a lot of these that we turned on, we could actually see the logic with the machine learning ones. You cannot edit them, um, but you can uh, turn them on and make use of them. And then we have the traditional scheduled alerts, right? That's what most of these are, where we can edit them, um, change them in any way, turn them off or on, do whatever we want to with those. So. So now let's do something more fun, right? This is the boring setup stuff that has to be done. But let's actually, let's come take a peek over. This, this environment has a lot more action than my test environment. So we'll start here and uh, imagine that this is where we're going to come uh, and take a look daily um, and see what's going on in the environment. We can see that events are up, alerts are up, and incidents are up, which is not always the case, but it looks like it is today. We can see the most recent incidents. We can see traffic over time. We can see what logs are having the most action lately. And we can also see here, are there any potential malicious events going on in your world? Let's see, do we have anything? Let's see, just for when we can click on one of these, let's see where this one's coming from. So it's going to run a little query for us and it's going to tell us the longitude and latitude of where this came from. So sometimes it'll actually give us a city. This has given us longitude, latitude. So maybe it's some little podunk town. Um, but sometimes it's Russia, right? Sometimes it's the Netherlands, but it gives us an idea where people might be attempting to compromise our environment from. Uh, then once we're here, we want to dig in and start looking at the incidents. What is happening, right? And the default is going to be looking at the last 24 hours. Let's give it a second to catch up to us. Uh, so you can see the default is set to the last 24 hours, but we can easily change that to the last 30 days, last 14 days or we can customize it to a specific like two day period or something like that from, you know, April 1st to April 3rd or something. And we can see there's a whole series of alerts. We can sort them by severity. Maybe I only want to look at the red alerts. Maybe I only want the medium alerts. Uh, maybe I only care. Maybe my job is to only care about the Defender for Identity alerts. So I only look at those, but we have those options as well. Uh, and you can see one of the things we were talking about earlier is that sometimes a single alert makes up an incident, right? Atypical travel, suspicious inbox forwarding, but maybe it's multiple, right? So we've got two alerts making up this incident or even 24 alerts or 39 alerts. So instead of you having to respond to 39 individual alerts, you can respond to a single incident to understand what's going on. So let's just take a peek at that one. Good hygiene would tell us that we should claim it. So we're going to 
assign it to ourselves. And then we're going to take it from new to active. And maybe I'll come down in here and I will say, you know, 13 at 12.30 AF started looking incident, right? So if someone comes behind me, they know that I'm actually taking a look at this one, right? And we can, this is just, again, the flyout menu is always just sort of a quick and dirty uh, eyeball of it. But we can click in here and view the full details. And I can assure you the slowness is me, not Sentinel itself. Um, and again, we can see the timeline of details here that are going on. So these looks like all of these are the same kind of event, but they could be different kinds. And we can look at all of the entities involved. So it looks like we have a couple different accounts. We've got Purview, SKH, Viocana, and a couple of IP addresses. So depending on how we want to do this, right, maybe we're going to be like, so is this something I need to spend more time on? So if so, what I'm going to do, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to run a playbook because I don't, I don't recognize these IP addresses, right? I don't recognize them. So I'm going to go ahead and come back here and I'm going to run a playbook that's going to identify those IP addresses for me. So I'm going to run this one that I have that's called get geo from IP. And then I'm going to do a little refresh. And once that refreshes, there should be something new in the comments. But that is taking its time. There we go. So now it's telling me that those IP addresses, right? So 115, 131, 11, 168 is coming in from Sydney, Australia. This one is coming in from Downing, Pennsylvania. And this one is coming in from Russia. So what do I think? Should I close this out because I've solved the problem or am I still suspicious, right? So I think I still need to do some research, right? Because I don't know enough about this. So I have a couple of options. What am I going to do next? So I'm going to take us back here and I'm going to open this up in a new tab because I like a lot of tabs. I'm also going to open up workbooks. But we talked one of the other um, new features that we have is the UEBA, the entity behavior. So when I was looking at this account, right at this specific one, let's go find out what SHKH at Sec Ninja does, right? So we're going to come here into entity behavior and we're going to look at the last seven days and we're going to do a little research on this person. So with the UEBA tool, um, what we've done is, um, you know, identifying whether a entity or user is compromised has always been sort of a time consuming and labor intensive process because you got to sift through all the alerts and connect the dots, maybe do some active hunting, and that takes a lot of time and effort. Uh, but with the UEBA, we can help sort of eliminate some of that drudgery from your life. Uh, it works by, like I said, I apologize, this is so slow. I'm sure this is my internet at home. Uh, but it works by building a profile across time and peer groups to start looking at anomalous activities for these users or IP addresses. So here, this is a test environment, but so you can see, but normally we'd know the department, we might know their manager, what city they're located in, a phone number if we needed to call them. And this is all the activity that SHKH Ninja has been doing for the last seven days. So these are all of the alerts involved. 
But there, what we could also see here, we could see, you know, user logged on to Office, uh, downloaded files from Outlook. Uh, could be lots of different things that we see uh, the user do, and that helps us determine if the behavior is strange or not. We can see the peer groups of the user. Uh, we could see, are there um, any actions by the account, any actions on the account? Have we, um, has their password been reset recently, right? Have they cleared out any logs lately? These are the things we can see here in UEBA. So even now I would say, I'm still not sure if I think this is suspicious or not. So we have incident 15874. So now we're gonna come into the workbooks and we're gonna find the investigation incidents workbook. So this one is meant to really help your team as quickly as possible determine whether an activity is suspicious or not. I don't know if this is gonna be a good one with this particular alert, but let's see. I already forgot what the alert number was. <laughs> One, five, eight, seven, four. If it doesn't hurry up, we may pivot over here. Let's look at some of these here. This is my little lab, which has fewer people in there fighting for resources. So let's see. Let's go take a look at this one here. Maybe, yeah, let's go look at this one. So incident 54. So let's go to the workbook. Yeah, and we're gonna change the time range. And we're going to look for incident number 54. And so we've got incident 54 here. And once we take a look at incident 54, we can see there's a couple of pieces that we could investigate. We could investigate the account or the IP address. So let's start with the account. We click on account over here, and then we can click on investigate account down here. And let's see if it gives us anything interesting. So it's going to look at the typical sign in locations for us, and it's going to give us a little map of the sign ins. So I do have some red here. So zero is where it's used to me logging in from, which is 192 logins from Tampa, Florida. But I have 15 sign ins from Virginia, which it thinks is weird, right? So that's why that's a location anomaly. So if I click on one of these here, it's gonna give me more details here about what I did during that logon, right? I had an interruption to my MFA logon. I used Bing, I went to office.com. These are all of the things I did. And you know, based on my account, is this suspicious or not suspicious? We'll have to determine. We can dig in and get more information. We can see uh, I had to log in with a password. It was my primary method of authentication. We can see what device I logged in from, a Windows 10 device, and I was using I was using IE 11. That seems weird. Okay. And what were the location details? Like we said, Virginia. I can also uh, determine what computer logons there were. I think this one was over the cloud, so we won't see any. But if you saw some physical logins here, what machine am I logging into? Am I logging into machines I don't usually log into? Am I logging into a server and I don't usually log into a server, right? We can look at my conditional access policies. Did I pass or fail a bunch of them? All of this is just to help you determine if behavior is suspicious or not, right? And once we determine that, then we can take action on that alert.
right? So it looks like most of mine were successful. I had a couple of failures, but that's not too bad, right? If they were all fail, 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 then success, I might be worried, right? Because that means maybe I guess the password. We can look to see, have I had my password reset recently? Have I had any failed bad sign-ins? And I have, look, I had a failed bad sign-in here and I had, to re I had a bunch of password resets. So this is suspicious behavior. Maybe I will contact this user. Maybe I'll suspend this user. Maybe I will change this user's password, right? I have lots of options of things I can do. And I could do the same thing that we just did with that by doing some research on the IP address, which we do the same thing here. You know, has someone else been using this IP address? Uh, what activities have been happening from that specific IP, right? So the purpose of this specific workbook is to let us know, should we go back and um, conclude that this is safe or do we continue to move forward, do more research or take action, right? But we also have a bunch of other really cool workbooks. Actually, I might pop over here. Let's see, did this one ever? Eh. This one has, because it's got way more data. This is one of my favorite ones, is the Azure Active Directory workbook. So, you know, again, because we're Microsoft, we have workbooks and playbooks and notebooks. Uh, workbooks used to be called dashboards. And um, in the dashboards, it's really to give us a visual representation of trends and anomalies in our environment. So, and the thing I like is it's not that this specific data can't be found somewhere else, but not in this nice graphical user base. So here, these are all the logins into my environment. The majority are from the US, which I expect, but I also have a lot coming in from Russia and Canada and India. You know, do I know that? That's a good, that's a quite, do I, is that something I know? I can click on that row of Russia and it's going to tell me who's signing in from Russia. Pavel, Arseny, they're all successful logins. It tells me how long ago they logged in. You know, is this behavior normal? Is this something I should be worried about, right? Uh, you know, looks like we only have a few failed, but I was doing a POC with a customer recently and we turned this on and they had literally every account from their global address list as failed from Russia which means to me someone had gotten a hold of either their user naming convention, right? Or somehow gotten a list of the gal and we're just hammering it, trying to find a way to get in, right? So we immediately turned on multi-factor authentication for all of these folk um, to help keep them from getting um, some kind of brute force attack, right? We also have sign-ins by device. So do we know all of the devices that are logging into our network, right? So Windows 8, I didn't know we had any Windows 8 devices here, though, uh, as we've been doing proof of concepts over this the last six to eight months, we found lots of Windows 7, Vista, and even XP, I think because a lot of users are sitting at home and have turned their um, actual work device over to their children so that children can have a good homeschooling experience and they dig something out of the garage, right? So they're using XP or seven, which we really don't want them to be using because those aren't supported anymore, right? No patches. Uh, but again, looks like this is some kind of directory sync account on a Windows 8 device. This is probably sitting under a desk at the office performing, right? Some kind of syncing account. So it's probably been long forgotten about. So maybe we need to go find where that is. And again, we've got uh, conditional access information where it's been applied or failed. We can do some troubleshooting of sign-ins, which is great. You know, sometimes we can help users before they even contact us. You know, sometimes it's just that the user didn't pass the MFA challenge or they forgot their password. But sometimes, um, you know, a user is unauthorized. You know, who's that? Let's find out. Is this somebody we need to deal with? And, you know, these workbooks, I look at incidents every day. Workbooks, I probably look at once a week. And if you have a person who can do that uh, eyeballing of workbooks, it's great because you can just sort of 
over time, you learn what's normal and what's not normal. And who are the problem, I don't want to call them problem users, but who are the people who continue to have challenges with whether it's MFA or something like that, right? So we can really get a good look at what's going on in the environment. And again, we've got a ton of workbooks in here, several different for Azure AD. We've got AWS. Um, some of are my favorites, uh, especially if you bring in information from your domain controllers, the Insecure Protocols workbook. This one can give us lots of information about, um, I was doing this with a customer earlier and uh, they were had Mappy over HTTP, which we don't really recommend anymore. Uh, some old Kerberos, uh, some NTLM V1 that we needed to deal with. Um, this one is all Azure AD, but again, we can look at what legacy authentication protocols we should stop using. Uh, oh, we need to set the workspace here. Oh, that's all right. Um, but again, we can see who's using what and what do we need to take action on. Or there's a great one in here for Office as well, which you can see. Look at your Linux machines. Look at the cloud app security logs. If you have, there's a couple of Palo Alto workbooks in here, right? So all different kinds. And again, we have a wonderful community of folk down here. If we go to community and go to the Azure Sentinel community, a huge GitHub where people share um, the different workbooks and playbooks and queries that they've written. So if you ever are thinking, I wonder if there's a workbook that does X, Y, Z, right? Here's one for dark trace. Here's one for, I don't even know what ALCID is, right? But so here's a whole series of workbooks that you can beg, borrow, and steal from um, if you want to try something new. And again, you can create your own workbooks with pieces of the other workbooks, right? So we could very quickly take a piece from um, the Azure AD notebook and then bring it together with your firewall to, to whatever information you're looking for. We can take that, right? Then we have uh, the automation. I'm going to come back in here for us. So automation uh, has a new feature for us. We've got automation rules. And with those, we can say, if an analytical rule contains multiple reset by user, and uh, let's say the severity is high, then I want you to assign the owner. And I want you to assign it to me. And then I want you to run a playbook that sends an email to the team. This could be, I don't know if you guys use Surface Now or Teams, but whatever methodology you want it to use um, to notify you, you can do that instead of coming into the console every day. You can have it let you know when something happens. And then I want to run another playbook. And that one is going to automatically disable the user, right? So we'll just call this one test. So I can immediately take actions on um, I, spe I specified this analytical rule, right? Multiple password reset by user, but it could be all of them or a specific one. It's really up to you guys, your imagination to how you want to do those. Or we can create the playbooks ourselves and they use log logic apps and we can create them from scratch, which would literally just be, we would name it and uh, start creating it. Or as we said before, back here in the GitHub, we have a whole series of playbooks that you can borrow as well. So these were the workbooks, but we also have playbooks. And like we said, the playbooks would, you know, with doing something with ServiceNow tickets, block IPs and Defender Advanced Threat Protection, block an on-prem Azure AD user, um, create an Azure snapshot, right? We have all kinds of things that you can do and really just limited by your imagination. What is it that you want to do, right? Get information from Virus Total, get stuff from Tenable. Um, have I been owned, right? So all of these are options for things you can do with the playbooks. 
So we've really talked a lot about the main features. So we haven't even really hit on any of the newer features that you can see that are in watch list. Uh, we have this new thing called solutions. These are in preview and solutions sort of pre-configures stuff for you. So if you're using Qualys or Proofpoint or Semantic, you can literally deploy the connector, set up the alerts, everything in just a few clicks. We also have, and there are more of these coming over time. Uh, we have watch lists and watch lists are interesting. They let us, um, they, they let us collect data from external data sources and correlate it against the events in Sentinel. So do you want to, um, maybe we have a list of employees who've been terminated in the last week and we have something where it's looking to see if they're trying to log into the network. Or maybe we want to suppress alerts from a certain set of IPs, right? We know these IPs. They keep getting alerted on for some reason, but we know they're safe, so stop telling me. I don't want to know anymore, right? You can import IP addresses or file hashes or usernames, right? Lots of um, options of things to do here. Or maybe you bring in the list of your C-level execs, and if a red alert fires on a C-level exec, that gets immediate attention, right? Something like that we could do. Or even our built-in threat intelligence here, where you can very quickly you know, if you have a certain um, IP that's attacking you, your environment specifically, we can quickly come in here, add a domain name, a file name, an IP address, very quickly add this to the list and Sentinel will start looking at it as a piece of information it should alert on. I have talked for a very long time. What questions do you all have? You're doing great, Andrea. So uh, one, th this is Tony. So one question I thought of was, uh, how do uh, how do our customers get started with uh, with Sentinel? Absolutely, that's a great question. So we do offer a uh, four week proof of concept. Hang on a second, and I'll share this little with you if I can find the slide. Where are you, slide? We do offer this nice little four week POC. If you guys want to kick the tires. Um, Tony and our team uh, can help here. So what we do is it's four weeks, an hour a week, and we can help you create a Sentinel instance. And we set up a subset of the data connectors. We have what we call the free data connectors, right? We talked earlier that the things that cost you money in Sentinel are ingesting data and keeping data longer than 90 days, right? But if you bring in a bunch of the M365 data, that's free. So we can help you turn this on with the Office 365 audit logs, things from Office ATP, Azure ATP, Defender ATP, Cloud App Security. Uh, and then, and you know, if there's anything else you wanna bring in, we're happy to help you do that as well. We help you configure the rules. And then over the course of the time, we review the incidents. We help you turn on workbooks. We configure some playbooks. We teach you how to go hunting right? How to dig deep into the query language and how to do some proactive hunting. So happy to help you do that. But honestly, to kick the tires by yourself, you need um, Azure Sentinel. I mean, you need Azure, right? You need an Azure subscription. And um, just a few clicks of the button, we can literally, uh, we literally go into Azure and we say Azure Sentinel. And for y'all, you'd create a new workspace. And create a new workspace. And we'll call it, you know, I'm going to put it here and we're going to call it test. And literally, that's all we have to do. That's turn, we'll say air quote, turn Sentinel on. And then bring it in the data connectors is what happens, is how you bring that data in. So let us know if that's something you're interested in. We would love to help you with that. And, yeah, that's you know, great. Trust and, 
I was just gonna say, trust me, I can talk the whole time. So. <laughs> <laughs> sure can. So, any any other questions? Guess not. So, if you got more, uh, if, if you got more ideas, Andrea, feel free. No, I was to say some of the things we didn't look at uh, real quickly that we can take a peek at were the uh, hunting, right? So we we can be reactive, waiting for alerts to happen, but we can be proactive and go on the hunt, and we can go here into hunting, and we have a whole series of I think we're past two hundred here uh, hunting queries that you could use inside your environment to start looking for suspicious behavior. And these are based on the MITRE tactics. So we could literally come in here and say, I want to look for persistence in my environment. I want to look for privilege escalation. Let's just, we'll pick one just for fun. And these are all the queries that have to do with privilege escalation. And I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to go the last seven days and then I'm going to run them all. So this is probably something I do once a week too. So along with the workbooks, I come in here run these queries and see if anything interesting pops up. So far zero, that's fantastic. <laughs> I'd love it when it's zero. Let's see if we have anything. All right, good, nothing of interest in privilege escalation, but we could do it again by that. We could do it by data source. So maybe I'm just gonna look at my sign in logs. Maybe that's the only thing I wanna take a look at. And I can do the same thing. Let's hope we get a hit on something so we can at least take a peek at it. There we go, we at least got something here. So once that happens, we can click on that specific alert and it's gonna tell us what is it doing, right? This query over Azure Active Directory sign-in considers all user sign-ins for each application and pick out the most anomalous change in location profile, right? So this is the query that's actually being run, right? And we can view the results. And let's see what it's gonna tell me. So it looks like Lee at Fancy Geek Girl and Ann Fisher at Fancy Geek Girl have had some strange locations based in the last three days. It's not expecting it to come from Tampa. It was expecting it to come probably from Virginia. So that gives me the chance to, um, is this something I need to dig into? Do I need to pivot now and start looking at Lee's logons into Office, right? So if I did, I could then pivot into here and start looking in the Office activity. Uh, let's see here. I'm going to look and see. Actually, I bet you there isn't anything in here because I bet you I haven't <laughs> had any office activity. Oh, there is some good. And so I want, let's say, and then we'll say where user ID contains we do, right? And I'm actually going to change that to the last seven days, right? So this just takes me from this query where we have suspicious action from Lee, right? So then I can come over here and start saying, did I have anything anything else suspicious from Lee, right? And that just takes me through my hunting method methodology, right? And then we can go back into the hunting logs again. And see, we've got a couple of other interesting ones, failed attempts to access the Azure portal. Let's see who that one is. So these are just places to start doing some proactive stuff. And not that you guys probably have the time to be doing proactive stuff, but uh, when you do, again, looks like there's a valid username or password. Maybe that's not something I'm worried about because uh, there's only one. Maybe if there were 30 of them, I'd be worried about it, right? Um, but I know we only have a couple minutes left, so I will stop talking because I'm tired of the sound of my own voice. So you guys know it, a single question? Yeah, there's one in the chat window, Andrea. Oh, okay. So uh, we've got, someone's asking, uh, can we configure the log retention times to be longer? Absolutely. So 90 days is what you get for free. 
but you can absolutely come in here and we can go into settings. And setting, workplace settings, it's in here somewhere where you can, it's under, yeah, usage and costs and data retention. And we can come in here, pick as many, as much time as we want to. And you can even, depending on how you want to deal with it, you know, maybe you want to keep everything what we'll call in hot storage for a year, uh, but you don't want to pay for hot storage, right? So then we can, you know, after 365 days, drop it down to a cheaper form of storage, right? So if you have compliance reasons that you need to keep it for seven years, right? Maybe after a, one year, we drop it down to cheaper storage to make your lives easier, so. And we also have the ability, like we said, to bring in a bunch of different kinds of logs as well. Um, so even if it's just like a text.log file, uh, for me bringing in some of the antivirus information for me is out of a text.log and I do this here in the same place is the only reason I bring it up. So, um, All right, guys, you're making me think I was boring since you don't have any questions. Oh, uh, this is this is great. Oh, it sounds like we've got someone asking a question. Uh, I guess one question before we finish up. Um, and it's, uh, we have we actually have sent on uh, my organization. Um, I had a question that we haven't really tested out yet. Um, but that the incidents that come in from other sources like Windows Defender ATP or endpoint for endpoint for or a defender for endpoint rather yep. or cloud app security. If I close the incident in uh, Azure, will it close the incident in those corresponding tools? It doesn't yet. Have you guys signed up for the private preview? Um, I believe we have. I said we, we are using it uh, currently. Um, right now, I've been using the actual individual dashboards to do some of the, do some of my work as we're kind of still learning it and working with it. Um, so, uh, with the private preview, you can sign up to do the two way connection between Sentinel and whether that's MCAS or Defender for Endpoints. So it should be coming that features coming in the next two to three months where it's both ways. But if you wanted to do the uh, if you want to sneak in and get to the preview, we get you in that as well. And that way you get access to all the preview features ahead of time. OK, so that is something that uh, is coming. Uh, yeah, that actually be great. Few months. Yep, absolutely. Thank you. Sure. Are you finding some value? Have you guys found some, um, you know, incidents or? Um, it's more just trying to get uh, more of that single pane of glass. Um, it was just because I, I, we have a number of people that check uh, the cloud app security or Defender for Endpoint or Azure security, et cetera. Um, but the one thing I've noticed is if I close it in one place, it's not necessarily closing the other. I noticed it with the yeah. uh, security.microsoft.com, that single portal location also. If I close something there, it's not necessarily closing it in uh, Office ATP or uh, what have you. Yeah, so, we're, we're working on it, I promise. <laughs> okay, that's awesome. Thank you. Okay, great. Well, that's the top of the hour. So. Um... Thank you everyone. Thank you, Andrea, for presenting. Thank you everyone for attending. Uh, the, the session has been recorded. It will be posted to, to our YouTube channel and I put it, I posted the link in the window. So if you're interested to uh, listening to it again, uh, feel free to uh, reach, you know, go to YouTube and uh, check it out. So thank you and have a good day. Thanks everyone. Thanks.